Hello, hello! Welcome to another episode of History in the Dark. I am your host, Darkness the Curse. And before we begin, as always, thank you so much to my generous patrons, my British Rail critics, and of course my underwater train finders. You are the reason why this content remains an eternal underdog. And today, we are going to discuss locomotives again, but this time, the running theme is locomotives that completely defied all the expectations that were set for them. They didn't really have to do a lot, or in some cases, started out pretty poorly. But in the end, they either lasted a long time, or set the stage for amazing designs of the future. These are five locomotives that defied expectations. The Namaquiland Clara Class. I just want to stress how many times I tried to say Namaquiland really fast and failed every time. I hope I'm saying that right. And if I'm not, I'm sorry to my South African viewers, but I'm pretty sure this is the first time I've talked about a South African locomotive. So, this is already interesting. The Clare class was a group of four 062 steam locomotives constructed between 1890 and 1898. They were designed by Kitson and Company. They were tender locomotives, but they were on the small side. They weren't exactly the largest pieces of equipment on the rails, but they proved to be actually quite reliable and effective for what they were for. They were placed into service by the Cape Copper Company on their 2 foot 6 inch gauge. They were meant to meet traffic needs in the upper mountainous section of the railway. Since they were actually constructed over such a long period of time, 8 years, the first three are almost always referred to as the Clare class, but the fourth was a little weird and sometimes people include it with the subsequent Scotia class instead, even though it probably did have more in common with the Claras. So, either way, it doesn't matter. Whether there's three or four, there weren't that many of them. At the time, smelting capacity at the mines was increasing, and they're still using mules to haul some of the loads. They really needed more actual locomotives, and these were supplied for that purpose. They were equipped with sheet metal casing above and below the running boards. That was to protect the motion and bearings as well as working parts of the J. Hawthorne Kitson valve gear above the running boards from windblown sand. The bottom encasement was actually hinged to allow easy access to the motion if needed. They also all had copper boilers. But for their size, they proved to be quite powerful and reliable for the most part. Their tractive effort was 12,860 pounds. That's 57.2 kilonewtons. For their size and the time period we're talking about, that was pretty good. They did have one hiccup though, though it wasn't their fault at all. There was poor water quality in the region, and the working conditions were hard in themselves. So they started having problems with their fireboxes and tubes. That's the reason why the fourth locomotive, the Albion, was given a shorter boiler to make room for a longer firebox. But what's really impressive about these, I feel, is that despite their dated construction, the fact that they weren't that big, and the fact that there were plenty of newer, much more modern locomotives built during the same time frame, they stuck around for quite a decent amount of time. All four actually survived till at least 1937. Though three of them were scrapped by 1942, engine number four, Clara, who the class was named for, actually stuck around and was still employed for shunting duties and local service as late as 1950. Mind you, Clara was the first built in 1890. She was 60 years old when she was finally withdrawn, and even then they did not destroy her, thankfully. She was plinth at the entrance of the Nobabeep mine workings in 1966. Later on, the Peter Philip Museum was established in the town in 1978, and at that point, she was moved to the museum. She's still on display outdoors, and there's actually a miniaturized live Steve model of her. Altogether, a quite impressive display for such a, frankly, modest little engine. The USRA 2882. Ah, yes, here we go. We couldn't have one of these lists without talking about a locomotive that was Big Chungus. Everyone likes that. We like talking about Big Chungus. Whether they were bad or good, it doesn't matter if they were big. We like talking about it. Size is everything. Except not really, we just went over that with Clara. But the USRA standard type 2882 is a little unique. This was built during a very, very weird time in American railway history. See, there was one time where the railroad system in America was completely nationalized. And I'm not talking about Amtrak. That's just for passenger service. I mean everything. 
and that was during World War I. All the lines were under the control of the United States Railroad Administration at the time, and that administration began issuing standard types to the various railways in order to improve efficiency. This is one of them. A total of 106 locomotives were built to the plans that the USRA put forward, and even post-war, it became a de facto standard design. It wasn't the first 2882 ever constructed, but over time development had gone into trying to make them larger and heavier because, look, this is America, that's what we do here. But there was another direction designs were going in, done by Norfolk and Western. They had decided to try to use smaller cylinders and a higher boiler pressure instead, rather than focusing on just making it bigger. The result was a locomotive capable of a very, very powerful performance, and speeds much higher when compared to the other two 882s that were being worked on. The USRA drew heavily on Norfolk and Western Railway's Y2s, and Norfolk and Western even gave them a set of blueprints for them. So effectively, this standard class was a development of the Y2s, and though they themselves didn't last super long, there were a ton of copies of them. See, they were really good, and the railroads knew it. So even when the various companies were allowed to resume normal operations and be private again, they wanted more of the standards. 106 of the originals had been built, and 116 various clones, with slight modifications, were developed over the subsequent years. That's actually really impressive. In a way, you could argue that the standards the stage for all future articulates and the way they were designed, showing that they didn't just have to be big and bulky, they could be fast and powerful at the same time. So that wasn't really being pushed until Norfolk and Western tried it and showed it to the USRA. No originals of the USRA standards still exist. Every single one of them was sadly scrapped, but a copy does exist. And it's actually, again, Norfolk and Western, number 2050. It was produced in 1923 by Alco, and it was called a Y3A class. It's currently on display at the Illinois Railway Museum. The PKP class EN57. PKP? The heck does that stand for? Oh, it's Polish. I cannot pronounce Polish to save my life. Do I have any Polish fans out there? I'm so sorry. Polski Kolodzie Panstwa? This is the Polish state railways, which again knocks another country off the list. I think this is the first time I've talked about a train from Poland as well. And this is, actually could be called a train, not just a locomotive, as it is an electric multiple unit that's used by the Polish state railways. They were first constructed in 1961 and entered service in 1962 for Poland. They were actually sent to other various countries over the years, including Yugoslavia, Croatia, and Slovenia. And while every other country has since retired them, uh, Poland didn't retire them until, let me check my notes here, and uh, never. Oh. Oh, they're still in service now. Oh, okay. What? Really? You guys are still using these? No way. But it's true. The EN57s were astonishingly successful. They were based on the earlier EW55 units, which happened to be the first EMUs built in Poland with 100% domestic components. The 57s were a step above that. They also work in a bit of an interesting way, and I don't think most EMUs are laid out in this fashion. Usually, there's just one power car, and the rest are just dummies. They don't actually have any power on their own. However, the EN57 is a three-car EMU with traction motors that are located in the middle car. That unit has four LK450 motors, each with a power of 145 kilowatts. The two outer cars are both driving trailers and don't have motors in and of themselves. They're distinguished the letters A and B. A has a compressor and B has the batteries. Each unit can sit up to 212 passengers and they are capable of multiple unit operation. They've gone through various different upgrades over the years. Not every single one of them necessarily looks the same. Some are a bit more streamlined, for example, but at their core, they're the same thing. The EN57 at the end of the day. Impressive work all around. I was actually suggested this by someone from Poland. So based on that, I'm pretty sure the Polish are very proud of these particular EMUs. And I can't blame them. As of this year, these things are 60 years old, and none of my sources suggest there's any plans to retire them anytime soon. And if and when that eventually does happen, at least one is preserved. EN57-001, the first production EN57 ever. 
a good choice for preservation. The London and South Western Railway O2 class. No, not oxygen. Although, we could just call it the oxygen class. I kind of like that. But I won't do that. The O2s were a class of O44Ts, tank engines, constructed between 1889 and 1896. A total of 60 wound up being produced, and they were produced under somewhat of a complicated situation. They were designed by William Adams, an English railway engineer. Adams had already been the superintendent of the LSWR, and he was given a pretty tall order with these things. The problem was that there was a great increase in the volume of commuter traffic with the suburbanization of London during the 1880s. To make this situation worse, there weren't that many locomotives in the LSWR that could undertake commuter traffic at the desired level of efficiency. Nothing they had would do what they needed it to do, so they needed a completely new locomotive that combined both the attributes of power and compactness. It had to be small and powerful, which is irritating to do, actually. He settled upon the 044T wheel arrangement to provide the basis of what would become the O2s. A tank engine seemed reasonable for compactness, so he had that down, and an 044T isn't exactly the largest wheel arrangement in the universe. He wanted them to be able to do mixed traffic operations, which is why they were given a relatively small wheel diameter and smaller cylinders. The end result was actually legitimately way better than it had any right to be. Given what he was working with, this could have gone wrong in a lot of ways, but Adams was a legitimately good railway engineer, and despite the pressures on him, he did a solid job with the O2s. They were compact like they were supposed to be, but they also had very high route availability. They could go pretty much anywhere they needed them to, and they were fairly powerful for their size, especially at the time, capable of 17,235 pounds of tractive effort. At 76.67 kilonewtons, not bad at all. Development continued on other more powerful units over the years, and eventually that did replace the O2s starting in 1897. But they still kept them around because they were legitimately good, they were reliable and effective, so they were put on lighter duties and became much more distributed throughout the system, mostly being used on much more restricted branch lines due to their very low weight and short wheelbase. Again, they were designed to be able to go wherever they wanted. Every single one of them survived well into the grouping, which is when the government of the UK decided, there's too many railways, we're gonna make you into only four. And thus the big four would be created. And LSWR fell into the Southern Railway. Despite beginning to become a little bit redundant due to more modern equipment and electrification coming into the fold, they still kind of stuck around. Two of them wanted being sent over to the Isle of Wight. More on that in a second. And some of their sisters started being withdrawn in the 30s and 40s, but World War II made it so they really couldn't get rid of any locomotives because they frankly needed all they had. In fact, several still stuck around even until British Railways took over, effectively nationalizing all the lines in the UK, removing the Big Four altogether. When it came to the mainland UK, some of these O2s were still in operation into the early 1960s, and the last one on the mainland, number 3225, was finally withdrawn and scrapped in 1962. But I mentioned those two earlier being on the Isle of Wight. The Isle of Wight is a separate piece of land that's still under UK jurisdiction. It's a county, but it's located in the English Channel, away from the main island. It's two to five miles off the coast of Hampshire. Those engines were sent over there because, frankly, they didn't have that many locomotives on the Isle of Wight. Those two O2s absolutely flourished on the island. They were perfect for the needs of the people that lived there. And some of their sisters actually wound up joining them later, resulting in 23 of them total chuffing around. They were still working there in 1960, when the O2 actually became the only locomotive class on the island. They survived there until the end of steam services. But even then, not all of them were cut up. Two. Numbers W24, Calborn, and W31, Shale, were actually retained to work engineers' trains during the electrification of the surviving Ride Shanklin line. Both were withdrawn after that was done, but that was late enough that the preservation movement was in full swing. Efforts were made to preserve both, but sadly, W31 Shale was not able to be rescued. She was scrapped in 1967, but... 
W24 Cowborn did survive. She was purchased by the White Locomotive Society, and in 1971 moved along with them to their new headquarters in Haven Street, which eventually became the Isle of Wight Steam Railway. Cowborn is still there. She was eventually restored to operating condition, and re-entered service in 1992. Another overhaul was done in 2019, and was finished in 2021, just in time for the locomotive's 130th anniversary, and the railway's 50th. Her class lasted far longer than anyone thought possible, and though she is now alone, the last of her kind, she stands proud as a testament to British locomotive ingenuity. The British Rail Standard Class 8. I just got done talking about you. You can't appear twice anymore. I thought you stopped doing that. You promised me. You're a liar. The Class 8 I actually have talked about before, as technically she appeared on one of my worst ever trains lists. But even there, I mentioned her amazing story. Because it's true. When she was first built and prepared for service, she was terrible. Absolutely dreadful. An awful locomotive. She was built very late when it came to steam locomotive tech, in April of 1954. Only one was produced, as a 462 Pacific steam locomotive, designed by Robert Riddles for use by British Railways. But when she was tested, she was just... horrible. She had poor steaming characteristics, while also having heavy fuel consumption. Which is never a combination you want. You want the exact opposite of that. As a result, the Class 8 had the worst of both worlds. And British Rail knew that they were going to be replacing the steam locomotive soon anyway. Why on earth would they build more of a locomotive that, frankly, obviously, wasn't going to work? Her poor drafting meant she couldn't adhere to timetables. They really didn't have a purpose for her. And no more examples were constructed. And she herself only remained around for eight years. Part of the problem was likely that she was trying to be at least a little bit ambitious, as she has some very unique traits. For example, she has a modified form of the Caprati valve gear that was based on Italian locomotive practice and allowed precise control of steam admission to the cylinders while improving exhaust flow and boiler drafting characteristics when compared to the more conventional Walshart's or Stevenson valve gears. That should have, on paper, created a free steaming, hard working locomotive that would have been very capable, but in practice, there were fundamental design errors and undetected deviations from the drawings made during construction that combined to prevent the locomotive from ever achieving the performance that was expected of her. The problem was actually known about even during construction. Mr. L.T. Daniels, who was a representative of the British Caprotti Company, recommended using Calchat blast pipes, which would have been able to cope with the fierce exhaust blasts that were experienced with the Caprotti system. A standard double chimney of the Swindon type had already been fabricated in order to cut costs, and it had been installed in the smoke box, supposedly before Riddles could even do anything about it. As a result of that, the locomotive suffered a very bad choke, in the area of both chimney and blast pipe being much too small for the pressure that was being created by the exhaust. She also had a poorly dimensioned ash pan and dampers that were, again, too small, which strangled the fire of air when operating at speed. The point was, she was constructed horribly, and the only prototype, number 71,000, Duke of Gloucester was withdrawn in December of 1962. Originally, it was thought that she would be selected for the National Collection, for actual preservation, but later they decided that only her cylinder arrangement was of interest, not her of herself. So one of her outside cylinders was removed for display at the Science Museum, and the other was removed to restore balance and readiness for scrapping. However, she wound up in the best possible scrapyard to ever be in if you were a steam locomotive in the UK, the Woodham Brothers Scrapyard. I've mentioned them before. They were located at Barry Island, South Wales, and the Woodham Brothers found that they made more money focusing on scrapping the cars that the railways hit them, not so much the locomotives. And the locomotives sat around for a long time, long enough for preservationists to work up the funds in order to purchase these locomotives. The Woodham Brothers were perfectly fine with selling the locomotives to preservationists so long as they arranged for transport and paid the extra fee they had to pay to British Rail if they didn't scrap the locomotive. Enthusiasts managed to get a hold of the Duke in 1974 because 
Well, she's one of a kind. She was the only type of her class ever built, and she was simply thrown away. Those preservationists formed the Duke of Gloucester Steam Locomotive Trust, and began working on restoring her to operation. Many of her components were missing, and it took 13 years of their hard effort to actually accomplish this task. But they did it. Additionally, during construction, they discovered many of the problems that I already told you about, and corrected them. As a result of these corrections, the Duke proved that her type could have been phenomenal. She actually turned into one of the most powerful steam locomotives that ever ran on British rail lines. Personally, she's one of my favorites. Her story is just remarkable. She was built flawed, and instead of fixing her, British Railways threw her away. But a group of people who genuinely cared about the history, who genuinely cared about this unique piece of locomotive technology, who wanted to see the Duke shine once more, saved her, and spent over a decade bringing her back up to steam. And now, she stands as an example of what could have been. In fact, she's so good, she's been used as kind of an experimental test bed. At this point, she bears very little mechanical resemblance to the way she was when she was operating under British Railways. And her owners, as well as many enthusiasts, are curious as to how hard she could really be pushed. It's possible that while already being amazing, she could be even better, showing that the standard Class 8s might have actually been something genuinely remarkable. They'd have been right under British Rail's nose the whole time, but they just didn't see it. Fortunately, a group of people later did, and now the Duke is free to ride the rails for many years to come. And with that, a special thank you goes to all my underwater train finders. Thomas Ward, Sundu 267, Orange Glass, Royal Hudson 2860, Lord Hawk 444, Benjamin Owens, Panzer Kitson 232, Mr. Black Rose, Josh Johnson, Metal for Life Guy, Anzac A1, Arthur Roy, DM Trouble Daphoon, Tommy Rossini, Lord Captain Von Thrust III, Joshua Long, Alaric Jaspers, Brian, Jack Carson's Rare Videos, Major Klutz, Hayden DeGrow, Ohio Trucker 1, and Master of None. Till next time, this is Darkness, and we draw a fond farewell.